So I am Shamik Siddhanta, a, a assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry here, and I'm also the coordinator of SciTech Spins, which has been going on for like one and a half years now. And today is the 11th lecture of the series, and it has been a really exciting journey. And uh, like last three lectures, it has been offline. So finally, you guys are able to come to our campus and take a look at our facilities. Okay, so today we have with us uh, Professor Bodhavitya Santra. So he's from the Department of Physics, and he will be talking about a very, very interesting topic, which is called making of a quantum computer. So you guys have heard about quantum computers? So anybody here who has not heard of the term at all? Oh, I don't think so. So pretty good. So I think it will be a very interesting journey uh, with Professor Santra here. And uh, you might be wondering, like, what is his background, right? Like, whether he's a scientist or engineer or what exactly? Okay, so I'm going to give a brief introduction. So, uh, it's interesting to note that Professor Santra did his BSc uh, in physics, BSc honors in physics, and then he moved to IIT Kharagpur for his master's uh, in physics. And then he went uh, for his higher studies, for his PhD to Germany, uh, University of Groningen, right? Or oh, oh, Netherlands, Netherlands, sorry. Yeah. And then uh, for further research experience, he went to Germany. First, he went to University of Kaiserslautern, then University of Hamburg, and then he moved to Austria, like University of Innsbruck, Austria, before joining uh, the Faculty of Physics here. Uh, in uh, 2019, right? So, uh, so today uh, he will be speaking about making of a quantum computer, which is precisely what his research is all about here at IIT Delhi. And before we start, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, like Professor Subodh Sam, uh, Sharma, uh, who is the Associate Dean of Outreach, and also the team uh, who is responsible for setting everything up. Uh, like Renu, Gaurav, and Kuldeep. Okay, and without their help, nothing would have been possible. Okay, uh, so I think uh, let's start off. Uh, and uh, very warm welcome to uh, Professor Sandra. And the stage is all yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, first of all, to the organizers and for this kind introduction and uh, all this uh, support team and all my students. So Poonam and Arna, without whom like, I cannot run my lab and because students are the assets. And also thank you all of you for uh, you know, taking the effort to come here. So I will speak a little bit about what we are doing uh, about quantum computer. And we are actually building a quantum computer in the lab. And uh, at the end, or maybe after a few tens of minutes, I will uh, maybe uh, you know, tell you to come in groups of maybe 10, 15. And then I will show you a few things here, like which are uh, you know useful uh, in making a quantum computer, like what it is actually. So, uh, how many of you have used a computer? <laughs> All of you, right? So, do you know when uh, the first computer was uh, in place? So, how many years ago? It was roughly uh, around 1945 or something, right? And uh, any idea what was the size of that computer? pretty large, right? It was filling up few size of these rooms. But now it is like you see how, uh, you know, its size is. So, you can do much more than what you can do in this computer compared to what was there, right? So, you see that uh, the first prototype that takes uh, pretty hard work and then uh, its size is also pretty large because you do not know how to optimize everything and uh, that's you try and find out and so on and so on. And then as soon as you know the main central mechanism, how it works, then you try to focus on how to miniaturize your things. So that these few steps one has to follow. First, finding out the main principle, main working principle behind it. Uh, and then once you know how the main principle is working, how you put together all components in a very structured way, so that everything becomes very compact, very small, right? <laughs> so for quantum computing, it's also pretty same, although the name has two themes, uh, say quantum and computing. Uh, I think the main motivation is computing and then some people are trying to use quantum theory uh, in order to uh, achieve that. 
So, how many of you uh, know like how to do quantum? Uh, so, sorry, the computing. So, I think all of you do computing, right? So, any calculation is computing 1 plus 1, 2 plus 2, everything is computing. So, uh, now are we going to build quantum computer for doing those calculations? So, what do you think? <laughs> so, now other thing is that how many of you have uh, this knowledge of quantum? How many of you have any course or any any study of quantum? Okay, uh, that's, that's not a problem uh, because you know quantum is nothing came from some out of the box. It's actually here. It's with us. This quantum is something so you can imagine. Uh, all of you take medicines at one of the other points, right? Now these medicines are what? These are some molecules. Now how these molecules are made? So, you just take atoms, you know atoms right, so atoms are one of the most uh, you know uh, tiny things, it consists of electrons, protons, neutrons which are the fundamental particles. Now, you have two atoms, how do you put them together, you need some kind of a bonding right. So, let us say uh, maybe I can also draw something here right. So, now if you want to make this molecule, we have to make a bond. And it is a pretty tiny particle, it is not that you can put this normal quick or this kind of glue, so that we can glue them together. And uh, so, what it has, it, it does is that, it is a pretty interesting, it shares some of the electrons. So, it makes a bond and then uh, some of the properties of this left atom is shared in this bond with the right one, right. So, that is why, that is how it makes this bond. So, that means, if you look into bond, you have to characterize this bond's property by the property of both these atoms. You cannot do by only uh, one atom, right. So, now that means, so this is a place where you can find, uh, you know, properties of this left atom and the right atom, both in this bond. So, it is a kind of a place, which is you can think of is like a superposition of two properties, right. And this can be a linear, it can be a slightly more complicated than that. But this is the most uh, fundamental thing what happens, why we are also standing here. Because, uh, so basically this is called the superposition, yeah. Superposition. Now, you can write them like, uh, let us say uh, 0 and then times some alpha and then plus uh, beta times uh, 1. So, basically in this case, this 1 is L and then uh, this, so this 0 is L and then this 1 is right. So, this is the most fundamental thing about superposition. If you have two uh, atoms or if you have two objects or if you have two quantum states, then you can write them in the superposition principle. So, quantum is everywhere. So, now I was just giving an example of a very simple atom, very simple molecule. But we are also made of such molecules and if this bonds does not work, we will not stand. I mean, we will just fall down in pieces into atoms, right. So, we are standing here because quantum mechanics works. So, we do not need to go into too many theories, it is nice, but you know so many Schrodinger equations and all other things. So, the great scientists has uh, work on those things. So, actually uh, some of the works uh, of this year's Nobel Prize on quantum uh, science and technology. So, they are also done in University of Innsbruck, uh, this, uh, this Anton Jalinger. So, and this Schrodinger, he was also spending lot of time in Austria and, and so those things, those people has done really outstanding work in defining the theory of quantum mechanics. It is not that they have done the theory and we are trying to observe them in the experiment, but it is here in the nature. We are just trying to understand. Now, why we want to understand that? So, because there are so many problems in nowadays, right. So, starting from this, uh, you know, warming up and then causing lot of problems in the climates. Uh, so, rain is not happening in the proper time, some part of the world is getting too much warm. So, I have just uh, tabulated few such problems, okay. So, before I go there, maybe I briefly tell you what you are seeing here. So, what you are seeing here, so this green uh, such a small uh, block, so these are actually atoms, these are iterbium atoms, right. So, there are about uh, I think 50,000 uh, atoms or maybe slightly more than that and then uh, uh, so, they are very, very cold. So, their temperature is uh, like, uh, say like a 10 micro Kelvin or something. So, 10 micro Kelvin means so the room temperature is 
about uh, 300 Kelvin. So say 273 plus uh, whatever you feel now to go outside. You can just write, now you can calculate. You can check in your mobile phone and then you just add 273, you will get this temperature in units of, this is the absolute unit, say 273. So now you can imagine this uh, 10 micro Kelvin that is almost close to zero, right? It's almost close to absolute zero. And you should also keep in mind that you can never uh, reach absolute zero. The reason is again due to some uh, quantum fluctuation. So classically you can, but still at classical zero temperature there will be some quantum fluctuations. Because whenever you reach very, very tiny uh, scale, things uh, behavior change because uh, they are now uh, in the scale of the atoms or electrons and protons. So many interesting starts to, things starts to happen. So when we are telling that we are making a quantum computer, so the main work, uh, this building the fundamentals and building the machines goes into this investigation. So how this particle works and where can you get this, for example, this linear superpositions things and so on and so on. Okay. And uh, like inside this glass box, what you are seeing, so this is also a specially made glass box. So, uh, so inside this, so the pressure, so the air pressure is very, very low. So here, for example, uh, the pressure is 10 to the power 3. It has a unit of millibar. Now, if you uh, go inside this, it has, uh, I think, 10 to the power 14 orders lower air pressure. So very, very thin air, almost nothing. Because once you made such a very nice uh, state of atoms, then you do not want them to be disturbed by anything else. Now, if you have some uh, other gas particles are moving around, so by the way, in here we are living here, so atoms and molecules are moving very, very fast. And very fast means how fast? So it's similar to the uh, speed of a jet plane, which is more than 300 meter per second, right? So you can imagine uh, for us, if a jet plane hits, what is going to happen? I think we should not think about it. <laughs> but uh, now it's about the comparison of size. So for these atoms, so these molecules and atoms which are moving in the air, they are going to make a similar impact. So they will be completely destroyed. So that's why you want to uh, you know, minimize the amount of atoms and molecules in the surrounding uh, area, surrounding volume of these atoms. That's why you need to evacuate this place. So it's a pretty, it's called a place in a high, ultra high vacuum. So that's why we need to create this special ultra high vacuum inside which we can uh, you know, laser cool our atoms, trap our atoms, and then uh, do whatever you want to do with them. Now, on the left side, this small, uh, this part, this part uh, is there in order to take picture. Okay, this picture I took from my mobile phone, it was visible there. But if you want to uh, look at uh, these tiny atoms, which are in the scale of nanometers or in that range, uh, you will not be able to see with your mobile phone. So, you need to, uh, you know, uh, use some special technique. So, I will also show you uh, something like that. Actually, I have a Harry Potter here. So I will show how to take the, basically this Harry Potter's picture is somewhere here, you know. So this quantum is also taking care of information. So what is information? Information can be a data, information can be a picture. And if you look into a picture, this is basically array of, it's a 2D array, where you are saving pixels, right? Now this information is actually here, because I have a lens here, right? Now you can, how can you record this information? Now, if you have an atom here, you will be replacing the Harry Potter, you will be recording the information of the uh, this atom, which, behave, which is behaving in a quantum mode, right? So, the message I want to give you that, you know, whatever you are doing is quantum, that is maybe 10 percent of the final work. But in order to, uh, you know, control the states and then image it, the final state detection, you need whatever you are looking in your everyday life. So you need electronics, you need optics, uh, you need to know about atoms, you have to do a lot of calculations, you have to do programming, all those things comes together and then that makes a nice uh, soup kind of thing, right? If you put lots of good vegetables and spices, you make a very tasty soup. So quantum is also, I mean, pretty similar to that. It's not one subject. It's a very highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, subject. It takes care of basically everything you can think of. Right. Uh, so now, some of the applications, so why we uh, uh, need to put so much effort, there are so many nice things, right? So why should we think about this thing? So we are pretty happy with our mobile phones, we can message our friends and all other things and 
we can watch movies. <laughs> But uh, why some people uh, spend uh, days and nights into labs, uh, that might be interesting, right? So for example, so you see the electricity, that is a uh, huge issue all over the world, right? Because uh, sometimes in many part of our country and many other uh, uh, part of the globe, so when the, uh, the summer time and, and some other disaster time, so this electricity is a huge problem. And making electricity is also a challenge, right? lot of disaster can happen. So you might remember, I don't know how many of can remember, but there was some disaster at uh, Japan in the uh, Fukushima. So uh, because they were trying to make better electricity, more electricity uh, in order to solve uh, their issues. Now what can happen if uh, this electricity, what you are sending through the wires, that is not, uh, you are not losing it. So you are sending it, you are getting the light and then you are reusing it. You know, so it's a recycling of electricity. So nowadays we are talking about recycling of plastic and many other things. But what about recycling of electricity? So if you want to do recycling of electricity, then you have to reduce the, you know, wastage of electricity, right? Which I think is very, very important uh, towards going uh, uh, or getting a, a green, green world, right? So green means pollution free world. Because whatever you do, you know, uh, there will be some pollution because in this manufacturing process, Maybe you can minimize, uh, but in the other view, if you can uh, use or reuse your uh, things in a good way, then you can, uh, you know, save lot of things. And then electricity is everywhere, starting from mobile phone to, I mean, whatever you are doing. So this requires electricity. So now, for doing those things, one needs a special kind of uh, material. is called a superconductor. So now, how do you make a superconductor? What is the recipe of a superconductor? So it has some special theories like uh, Hubbard and Fermi though they make it. But now those theories needs to be tested, right? Until you test it in a real thing, maybe if you have a very good recipe, you will not be enjoying it until you make it at your home. When you make it at your home, then you will really know how good. And you can compare with your existing or some other food and it is good or you want to make slightly better, slightly tweak it. So that's the reason we need some little uh, few qubit systems where we can, you know, uh, uh, design those uh, Hamiltonians uh, which are defining those uh, system which can uh, behave like a superconductor. And then uh, we know whether uh, these theoreticians who are telling this is uh, good or we have to do something more or what do we have to do that change. And this smart materials also <laughs> this second one. So the reason why from such a large uh, computer uh, we are getting these small smartphones is we are, uh, you know, building our capability of uh, many, many smart materials. And just to give you the limit, so at the moment the uh, size of the chips uh, which are manufactured at uh, mostly by Taiwan, uh, some semiconductor manufacturing company and also with uh, Samsung. So these are now reaching in the uh, scale of uh, 1 nanometer or something. So 1 nanometer is, you know, extremely small. Uh, can, you know, I don't know, I think it's very difficult to imagine also. Now for doing such manufacturing also, we need uh, very good manufacturing machines. So how do we do that? I mean, we, we can tell one nanometer. So there are techniques called laser lithography. So deep ultraviolet laser lithography. There are some companies in Netherlands, actually only one company makes it, its name is ASML. So they take some lasers, it's a very specialized <coughs> lasers. And now uh, they make some lithographies like interference. And that's how they make this, uh, you know, very small uh, and it has to be very precise also, right? Uh, so they do it for making transistors which are of size 1 nanometer or something in that, in that range. Okay. Now uh, those things are, when those chips are at this 1 nanometer scale, again they are uh, close to the dimensions of atom, they are also you have to take care of uh, quantum mechanics. It's not anymore in the classical region. So quantum tunneling and all other things will happen. So another thing is the drug design. So this simple example what I was telling you. So this drug, so you all know that how many, like how we all, the whole world suffered due to COVID and we have been desperately looking for vaccines and other medicines. So these are basically advanced drug design thing. Now this drug design is basically taking some atoms and then putting them into a, a good combination so that you come up with a special molecule which has some special property which you need for uh, treating for the treatment of some special disease. So it's just a directed thing. It's not that we are doing something 
and then uh, we got some outcome, what can we do with that. But we have a problem, existing problem, we know what we need and it's kind of a bottom up approach, right. And we have some ingredients, now what should be our arrangement so that we can uh, reach our state. It's also we can think of like optimization problems. Now, uh, now talking about this optimization problem, so you all know how the bad traffic conditions in Delhi. So that is about, uh, it's, a, it's a traffic. So traffic is going in one direction, another direction, and now if it is not done in a proper way, they will got stuck in one place. So that is another optimization problem. So these problems also can be, uh, you know, addressed if we have a quantum computer. And there are many other things like a secure communications, and uh, like if you are sending one message from one place to another. So maybe there are few things which you do not mind if your another friend knows about it, but there are certain things uh, when you will grow, you will realize that in the banking industry and there are some other more informations uh, which uh, you or for the sake of national security, it's not good that it gets leaked to your uh, other enemies. So those things are very, very important. It's, it's, it's a safety issue, right? So it's very, very important for all of us. It can be that we are not doing it. Maybe some of our friends are doing it, some of our other colleagues are doing it, but it is important for all of us because uh, at the end if our country is safe then only the people who are staying here they are safe. So this communication in a very secure way is very very important and then this geoscience is another very important aspect. So uh, you know we know that sometimes during rainy time or any season uh, some part of the street goes down suddenly right. So and then it creates it can create disasters and there are also some stories come up that some high rise building suddenly collapse because uh, you know there was some sinkhole kind of thing. Now from top whatever image you do uh, it is very difficult to uh, detect there is something bad going on inside. But if you have some instrument which can really detect those things and predict that okay after this much time uh, this building is going to collapse then you can at least save the people who are living in the building. Right you can you get some time to evacuate those places so on and so on. So these are only few examples there are many more. So. Uh, <laughs> Now, just talking about atoms or quantum, like uh, what do we need? So here I was telling you about this two states, right? So we need basically a system, it can be any system, but basically it has to be a system where we can define two states in a very, very deterministic way. You say it has to be pretty 100 percent, just 99.99 is not enough. It has to be at least 99.9999 or maybe if you can have few more digits that is even better. Right, so it has to be that accurate level. So all the states measurement has to be done, and this equation that you can forget for the moment. Uh, you know, this is something is called the Schrodinger equation, and this is something what you can use uh, in order to uh, you know uh, explain the behavior of this. Animal. So, but you see that it's also not pretty long. It's a pretty short equation. Right, I think in the classrooms sometimes you solve even longer equations, right? Differential equation. So. Okay, now this superposition state what I was telling you, this is exactly like this. Now you need some physical system, right? So this is all what is happening, what can be done. So one physical system is this one. So it looks slightly different, but it is the energy level structure of an atom. So this is the energy level structure of the cesium atom. Now you know that there are, how many of you have studied about uh, the periodic table? So all of you, right? So Cesium atom, where does it lie in the periodic table? Is it alkali atom or alkaline earth atom? Alkali. alkali atom. So it lies in the first uh, column, right? Yeah. So and it's one of the heaviest atom. And it has one property uh, that it has only one valence electron which is sitting on the outer uh, most orbital. So there are also atoms which are more complicated, uh, has better. Uh, property and so on, but for the moment we are taking a simple atom, cesium atom and then it has many energy states, right. So these are coming because of the fact you see that uh, at the center, so this is the place where uh, the, elect, uh, the neutron and protons are there, so it constitutes the nucleus and now in this orbit, orbit so electrons are moving. Now when the electrons are moving, so electrons are negative charge, right. Now uh, when the charge moves, it creates a magnetic field. Right. So now this magnetic field interacts with the electrons at the center, uh, so at the, with the nucleus at the center, 
and this interaction this is sometimes called ls coupling or at a higher field jj coupling so but this interaction gives rise to other splittings so these splittings are what you are seeing here right so for example here this uh, this is one state this is another state and there are some other states here so these two states are also used uh, for the uh, navigation purposes in the gps so the satellites so we all like i think nowadays when we go everywhere we just switch on our google uh, navigation and then uh, type in the location and then the, we go there so how does it work because our phone has some gps receiver and uh, in the satellites there are some clocks which are keeping uh, time and then there is not only one but there are a, a, a network of such satellites and that is how the location is determined and if you can determine the location of you and you have given one target then you know how to navigate ok of course besides that you need to do little bit more like which paths is there and not for that you have to do some data but finally uh, what you need to find the navigation so that is why this this transition here this f equals to 3 to f equals to 4 is a very well known and very well, well established one and this exactly same transition we are using for our qubits and these two states are going to be our qubits right. So now uh, <coughs> there could be many different uh, candidates for encoding qubits so like this one example is atom that I was telling you already so there could be other examples so like uh, superconductor superconductors can also be used uh, for encoding uh, quantum states so superconducting qubits like this Google IBM they are heavily working on superconducting qubits and uh, there is something called trapped ion qubits so where you can trap ions in a chain and you can one can trap uh, 50 or hundreds ions in a chain so ions are charged particle so that is why they need some electrostatic forces and uh, this companies like alpine quantum technologies actually uh, alpine quantum technologies from the place uh, where I was uh, where I was before coming here uh, and uh, but I was not in that but uh, I was part of this larger fraternity and then uh, IMQ is another one at uh, US this, uh, so these are some of the leading companies there are some more are coming up and uh, this photons so photon can also be used uh, I will show you here how you can use photons so if you have photon so it has some uh, like what is a photon or like if a bunch of photon if you think of this forms the electromagnetic wave right now this electromagnetic wave has um, the this electric field and magnetic field so for example maybe now I go in this side in this jog and then I do it here so let us say if you have uh, an electromagnetic wave so then this would be uh, let us say one wave defining electric field and then the orthogonal to that there will be another one right so this is going to be the magnetic field so these two field makes it a electromagnetic field now this plane of uh, electric field so at in this picture this is in this plane right in this plane it is oscillating this is uh, so this plane is called something uh, like a polarization now this polarization you can tweak it many ways you can either keep it in this plane you can maybe take it uh, like in this plane you can maybe put it at this angle now this polarization is something what you can use uh, for defining qubits so if you let us say instead of this if you take a mixture of this and this then this light has two components of polarization it's a vertical and horizontal right now that one you can encode like one component for uh, like state one one component <coughs> from state two so uh, there are also some companies uh, mostly ch there are some good Chinese groups also who are working on it and some uh, this in Canada there is a company China to computing they are building uh, quantum computers based on photons now these atoms are also uh, like pretty cool uh, I mean in reality also they are pretty cool so <laughs> micro Kelvin and uh, uh, so there are already few companies who are building quantum computers like Pascal is one at uh, France as a cold quanta is a very good company so uh, at US and uh, <coughs> then uh, Q era and then few others uh, so in India also there are a few companies are coming up at uh, Raman Research Institute at ISAR Pune and actually at our institute also from our group also 
uh, we are trying to make such a computer. At the moment, we are trying to raise funds. Now, uh, as we have by now realized that laser play, plays a crucial role in order to uh, you know trap, control, manipulate these quantum states. So that is the reason we also develop our own lasers. And this is not our developed laser, but we are working on at uh, 852 nanometer. But with this, I will show you something like how to take picture of atoms. So after some more time. Uh, so this Harry Potter's picture, where is the Harry Potter's picture here, I will show you to that. So when you are taking picture of atoms, it's pretty in a similar way, but you have to make it a slightly better so that aberrations and errors, those things are minimized. And then also I will show you like how to split a beam and how to also change the splitting uh, fraction in a beam, all those things, okay. And if you know these things, then you just have to add them in a logical way, structured way like a circuit. So, you might have heard about this quantum circuits or uh, this basically quantum circuits are some logics. Now, when it comes to real uh, implementation, real life implementation, you have to make pulses and sequences of intensity and a few other parameters. So, in a series, so that they are equivalent to this circuit. And for that, the ingredients are this, uh, you have to split the beams, you have to change the ratio between the beams, you have to take this picture. So, you see these are the very small ingredients and once you make the connection, you connect from beginning to the end, you have a full story and end result is your, uh, you know what uh, system you have and uh, what you got from that. So, uh, yeah, there are some good things about this thing, but I think I will not talk much about this, uh, like why atoms are good, uh, maybe I will talk a little bit about it. This, uh, this atoms, ions, these are pretty um, perfect because uh, like whether you are having an atom here or like we also have now Mars missions, right? So we can even test if there is a atom, cesium atom in Mars. And we can just send a little laser with a little, uh, you know, uh, you know, photodiode and then we can get some cesium there and then we can see what spectrum we are getting. But you see this cesium atom or any atom, they are perfect because they are defined by their number of electrons, protons, neutrons. So, it does not matter whether we are doing it in on earth or on Mars or somewhere else, uh, they would be always same because this is their characteristics. So, they are pretty, so they are the most perfect thing. So, we can think of, right, because if one electron is off, one proton is off, it becomes another atom, it becomes something else, its energy changes completely, right. So, this really pitch perfect thing. So, if you can think something perfect that is this atoms molecules. Now, uh, there are also the superconducting qubits um, uh, and quantum dots and nitrogen vacancy centers. These are also pretty good, uh, but they are not the nature's qubit. They are manufactured. They are also very good, but it has some manufacturing errors. Uh, but they are made in a way that they can mimic uh, like an atom, so kind of an artificial atom. Okay. Uh, so, this cold temperature, so what we are uh, doing, we can do with the cold atoms, cold ions, these are pretty cool. These are not inside a pretty large dilution refrigerator. This is not ambient cooling. So, ambient cooling is something when you put your uh, food or anything inside a refrigerator, you are not directly touching the uh, food or object. So, you have an, an environment and ambience inside which you are putting it and it is getting cold thermal with a thermal exchange. So, what we do with our atoms is that we directly tune the lasers to their energy and then directly suit them and that is how we cool the atoms, right. So now we can ask like how can you cool something with a laser because laser normally heats it, right? I will, uh, anyone have any question on that? Like how can one cool, uh, yes? Yes, sir, how can someone cool? Yeah, so, uh, so now, um, so basically cool, hot, you know, these things um, and that, uh, so how, how do you measure something is cool, uh, something in hot, Some something is, uh, has a little bit more energy, something has a lower energy. How, how do you measure that basically? Uh, yes, those things are related to conductance, uh, uh, but it is something going in the same direction. So, it is something going with the thermal thing and this basically what is the temperature basically? Maybe I measure of hotness of a body. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, basically measure of how hot or how cold is a body, that is the temperature. 
now uh, what defines a body is cold or what defines a uh, body is hot <laughs> what Yeah, but you know all these things constitute something which is called energy at the end, right? Mm -hmm. So total energy. Now this energy can be of few different forms. Maybe this due to contraction, expansion. Uh, maybe due to pollution. If it collides with another one. Black body radiation. All these things, uh, black body radiation is also radiation of energy, right? Yeah. So it depends on the body. So uh, whatever is its total energy, if it gives the radiation you know and if you go from a colder object to a hotter object the radiation pattern change why because uh, it's energy change right that's why the associated uh, wavelength that changes right so now uh, uh, this total energy can be of few forms one is kinetic energy this kinetic energy is associated with a particle which is moving very fast or it also related to uh, karma, you know, temperature it's also related to its velocity because if the velocity is very hard uh, very fast then its kinetic energy is very fast it will have a kinetic energy and then its potential energy and then its interaction energy so basically these three things uh, now for the case of atoms uh, i think i have those things little bit later so uh, what we do is that we try to reduce this kinetic energy as much as possible so I was telling you that at room temperature, these atoms are moving in the speed of jet plane, right? So this is 300 meter per second or more. So from there, we are bringing them down to few millimeter per second. So you can imagine how slow you are doing, right? So that is the main trick about laser cooling. So now for that, you need a very, very uh, defined frequency of laser. So it's not that we are really, you know, cooling it by, you know, shooting the laser to the atom, but we have a specific frequency which these atoms absorb and then they radiate in all sides. In that process, they get a momentum key. Like if you see, if you imagine a car is moving on a highway, if you take a small ping pong ball and if you think of like, can you stop this car with that? You know, it would be a weird thing to think about. It's not possible, right? But on the other hand, if you do the tiny calculation, this ping pong ball will definitely give a small key. Now think of instead of one, maybe millions of ping pong ball and then you add all these uh, small momentum kicks together and as the point when this uh, would be, you know, uh, same as the, uh, you know, momentum of the car, it will be stopped. Although it sounds weird, but you can do a small calculation. You can take the weight of a ping pong ball, it would be maybe few gram or something and then you can take the, uh, the standard car, maybe 1.5 quintal or maybe 1 quintal. And then you can do a small math, you know, any children can do that calculation. It's not so hard once you know what you have to do. So it's very important that to find out what you have to do. I think that is the most important part because once you know what you have to do, then doing that is uh, just uh, you have to do it. So that is something, uh, you know, finding out how to do that, that was so important that this invention of laser cooling got also Nobel Prize. So it, it was in 2000, so sorry, in, uh, it's 1997. It was discovered in around, uh, you know, 70s, 80s and so on. So then uh, we can also measure uh, this. I was telling you that you have to measure it in very, very precise way, the final state. That also we can do this in a, uh, in a very good time. Very good time means uh, if you can think of the age of uh, universe, it's a pretty, pretty long. And in that time, these measurements or these clocks, they will uh, lose or make an error like one second only. It's a very good measurement, right? And there are a few other things like as you can scale up the qubits and then uh, you know, addressing individual qubits and so on. So now, how many of you have seen pictures of atoms, of single atoms? So what you are seeing here, so these are actually pictures of single atoms. So in the first line, so this each dot, so there is this chain of atoms and then they put some uh, series of lenses and then they took a camera and then uh, maybe if I go back here, so this was the picture. So, so <coughs> this is a vacuum chamber and inside vacuum chamber the atoms were trapped something like this, it's called some called optical tweezer and then they had uh, some imaging system lenses 
uh, so on this side also here this small thing is a combination of lenses called objective microscope objective and they have some uh, camera excuse me sir uh, from yeah. where you do collect the item up to the lighting chamber uh, so that is uh, i have one picture there of uh, vacuum chamber this is just a cartoon from one paper so for that we need a open i have that picture i will show you today what we are building in our lab you need you need a atom source basically it's a kind of a dispenser or a small open inside the vacuum you have to heat it resistively and then it will evaporate atoms so that thing you have to you know trap in this uh, light field i will show you a better picture now so but now so this picture so these are uh, like here in this first line this picture was taken like this and the way i will show you uh, like how you can image this harry potter is exactly same you know it's a optics it's a pretty same thing it's a just is following the geometric it's a geometrical optics actually <laughs> now either it's a atom or it's a harry potter or even when you are taking your picture so in the mobile phones also these things are done in a very uh, good way but like our dimension is a meter or more something but when you are talking about a nanometer then you have to do special uh, things but the underlying uh, you know theory they stays same okay so like here these are uh, like 65 atoms so the separation between them is like few micrometer so here these are like 100 atoms uh, like a 10 by 10 array and here so few scientists at france they became really enthusiastic they wanted to make eiffel tower and this eiffel tower is made of 126 atoms is isn't it amazing like you make an eiffel tower with i mean which one is more interesting to see is the real eiffel tower or eiffel tower made of atoms <laughs> i think if you work in these things if you are uh, really in the lab then you will be really amazed to think even think about it that you can make an eiffel tower with uh, atoms so yeah so i think let's see how long it takes for our for us to trap single atoms then uh, you can give me some proposal like which structure i should make and i can also try to make that <laughs> so uh yeah now there's another thing so uh, maybe this might be going a little bit uh, at once but just i'm telling you that when you have these atoms in order to make quantum computing they need to be interact with each other right so now these atoms are sitting maybe 10 micrometer apart or maybe 5 micrometer apart so you can either bring them together or uh, you can do something else but there are some risk in bringing them together like if you can think of uh, having a glass of water and then you want to uh, bring it from one room to another room you have to be very very slow because if you go too fast this water might spill out and you will lose some water because this is just just working like a wave right now these atoms when they are behaving like a quantum mechanically these are quantum waves so you can think of uh, if you don't do this operations in a very slow adiabatic way they will lose their information which you do not want so if you do this slow then of course you will be able to do this but there are certain things like how long they will be trapped and uh, how long their property will remain they <coughs> might not allow you to you know uh, move one from one to another for such long time so there is another trick is that you uh, you know excite the atom to a very very lower orbital so if you excite the atom to a very very lower orbital then basically it's Uh, you know total size or the total wave function becomes so large that it can interact with the neighboring atom so that is what is shown here so if you excite the atoms this is something called rydberg excitation or the rydberg spectroscopy so rydberg was a you know very famous very good scientist uh, few decades ago so he invented this one for the first time and then many people are using this <coughs> so for example these atoms in this array of blue and uh, green atoms so this a uh, few atoms were excited to rebuild state and you see this uh, kind of a ball kind of thing around surrounding it this is representing its interaction volume so now in this interaction volume if another atoms comes like this second one then they will interact with each other so that's how the multi qubit like c not and tofoli those gates are implemented so yeah now uh, like why cooling is important so whatever quantum computing we do either it's a uh, superconducting based or atom ion based we talk about cooling right <coughs> now you can see one parameter here so it's called a de broglie wavelength so in this parameter there are only few things so like m and t so m is the mass of the particle and t is the temperature 
So these two are uh, physical parameters. So other things like pi is a constant, h cross is a Planck's constant, reduced Planck's constant, and kb this is a Boltzmann constant, right? So these things you cannot change. So you can only change mass or temperature. Now, if you take very very tiny particle like electrons, electrons are much smaller than atoms, right? Atoms are, if you look from electrons point of view, atoms are pretty massive, right? So now we have to really change the dimension of thinking, not in this scale anymore. So we are now discussing in a scale where atoms are pretty massive. So think about it. Now for the electrons, if you insert the electron mass here, even at a room temperature, you will be able to see a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, amount uh, of this deep value of this. And if it is an OF, it will also make some interference, which you will see here. This is a picture of electrons which are uh, making interference uh, at a room temperature. But it become, if it becomes an atoms or ions or molecules or some other composite systems, then if you change it mass, it will become something else, so you do not have that option. So the only option which is left is the temperature. So just cool that, cool the, so reduce the temperature, so cool down the system. And if you cool down the system, as you see this is uh, in the denominator, this thing will go up. So that is the reason why cooling is so important in quantum uh, computing, it does not matter which system you take. System to system the cooling technique changes, but the basic uh, reason does not change, <laughs> why you need to cool. And like here is the example of few atoms which are moving at a room temperature, so these red dots are atoms and then this arrows are showing which direction they are moving, they are moving randomly, right. Now at a room temperature they will not have any significant uh, amount of de Broglie wavelength, uh, it also sometimes called thermal wavelength because it is related to their velocity, their motions, so their kinetic energy then at the end. But now if you start reducing it then you see slowly its uh, size of this wave function increases and slowly there will be one point when they will start overlapping with each other, right. Now when they will start overlapping with each other, it will start to form another state of matter um, which is called bose einstein condensation. And uh, we should all feel proud that this theory was first given by one of the Indian scientists, so Satyendranath Bose. So he first, uh, you know, discovered this theory for massless uh, uh, particles for photons and then he wrote one later to Einstein. And he wrote that thing in... Um, I think I am not remembering because he was an Indian, he did in New German. Yeah. But then Einstein wrote this paper in German and then he got it published. Uh, and this was in a German. So it was in 1914 or yeah. 24 or something. And after that publication, Einstein uh, thought what about doing this for massive particles. And then he derived it for massive particles and like uh, for, for, for atoms and so on. And then it was again published and that is from that time uh, the name was Bose-Einstein condensation, right. So by, you see that by cooling we can also achieve Bose-Einstein condensation here. So all these very nice things, so if you can cool down a system you can achieve uh, so many interesting states which is not possible to achieve at uh, room temperature or at, a, or at a higher temperature. But the take home message you can take that in order to uh, you know keep and reach the uh, uh, pretty pristine this. Uh, uh, quantum properties for any kind of qubit we need to cool it. So if we cool any system it uh, reduces the thermal vibrations and so on and then uh, all the quantum features comes out, right. Uh, yes, so, so many Nobel Prize uh, was awarded to this field. This is not a field of one day. So now you are seeing the hype uh, for last maybe two years, three years, five years but the work has been started maybe 100 years ago or even longer. And some of these works which are directly related, this has been started 70, uh, around 1970s or 1980s or so. But the, uh, you know, seed was started at that time only, 1924, 25. Uh, that from that time people are trying how to pull the atoms. Because their main motivation was to reach, uh, one of the biggest motivation was to achieve uh, both science and condensation. And then uh, I think in 2018 Nobel Prize was uh, with Artur Raskin and two other uh, scientists. Uh, Artur Raskin received it for uh, realizing that light can give some pressure. Because here we are talking about laser cooling, right. So now he was doing many experiments. Now you know, have you seen, uh, how many of you know what uh, picture is it? <coughs> this is a comet, right. So. 
have you noticed uh, the direction of the tail of the comet? Is it towards the sun or is it always opposite to the sun? Always opposite to the sun, right? So now why this is always opposite to the sun? So the comet of, uh, the tail of a comet consists of few dust particles and debris and so on and so on. So like, you know, even it is a simple thing and if you are doing it for the first time, it's uh, not so easy to understand it because you have not, you have never seen it. So you need to understand it, you have to compare it with some theory and if you do it for the first time, there is no theory to compare. So you have to develop and that time people try to find analysis. So that time Arthur Raskin, uh, Steve Chu and Bill Phillips, a uh, few other scientists who were doing this pioneering work on cooling atoms uh, or uh, cooling any object with lasers, they were trying to find analogy and then they suddenly noticed this phenomena which we have been maybe looking into, uh, we knew that this is happening. So they got another confirmation that this uh, light can give pressure to something. That, that was a very, very outstanding discovery that uh, light, called, light can give pressure to something. This is called radiation pressure, right. <coughs> so uh, now the picture what you are seeing here, so here you can read here, I don't know whether you are, but I am reading it for you. So we report the first observation of optically trapped atoms. So that was around 1986. They have been working for many years uh, and then uh, they saw it and this picture uh, are some sodium atoms. So they have first trapped some sodium atoms and in this article you see the name of uh, Steve Chu, Stephen Chu. So he actually got Nobel Prize with another two um, scientists. I don't know why Arthur Raskin didn't got for that. Uh, maybe Arthur Raskin just when he realized that he can uh, trap atoms or trap any uh, particle with uh, you know uh, lasers uh, by using optical tweezers, he moved to biology because this biology there are many. Uh, problems with a single molecule biophysics which were not possible to study at that point because in order to trap single molecule you have to isolate the molecule and then keep it in a controlled way. How do you do that? So you see once one technology is invented for whatever purpose it gets so many applications and then it gets even more Nobel prizes. So Arthur Raskin worked into this uh, trapping molecules on those fields, those fields uh, using optical tweezers and did lot of work and then in 2000 18 he got uh, Nobel Prize uh, for doing that uh, and Steve Chu already received it long time ago and you know if you do this thing you will be also pretty famous and powerful. You might remember or you can also search uh, the, the biography of Stephen Chu. So he was one of the I think principal uh, scientific advisor of US president so US government and, uh, and he was also the uh, head of the atomic physics commission or nuclear physics commission in, in US or something. So you know, if you think of how to become a powerful uh, person, politics is not the only option. You can also do it by uh, doing these things in a very precise way. So when you think about your career, you know, just do one thing in a very good way and you will have multiple options open, right. So I think at the beginning it is very important to keep all options open and then make your base so strong, you become a leader in one thing. Once you become a leader of one thing, you will find multiple applications of that and then many doors will be open for that. So I would like to, all of you are pretty young, so all of you should not think like what job I am going to get after my uh, B take, after my M take, but because you know you have only one life, you will get money anyway, that does not matter, like getting few 10,000 is not a big deal for all of you I hope, uh, it's, it can be big deal, but if you work average, if you pass your uh, you know, exams in a good way, then you will definitely get it. But then what are you going to do with that? Just watching movies and then uh, why don't you make uh, movies in the molecular scale? Why don't you make movies in the atomic scale? That makes things even more interesting. Then people will remember you. Right? Then you don't even have to think about money, right? Because all things will be at your doorstep. So then you don't have to do this computing anymore. So you will be only doing quantum, I guess. So, Okay, you see there is this series of uh, Nobel Prizes then from 1997, so first with the laser cooling and then Bose-Einstein condensation, precision spectroscopy with lasers, optical frequency comb and something, there are so many interesting things. Uh, like you can also, you know, take a note of this thing and then at home you can search because on everything people got a Nobel Prize, so you can think it's absolutely not possible to talk about even a single thing in a very deep. Uh, <laughs> But you can search like uh, and then you will find many, many interesting things. 
and then quantum control of individual atoms and ions and uh, this topological phases of matter, optical tweezers, ultrasound pulses, and then this here quantum information science using photons and atoms. So, then you can imagine if there is so many Nobel prizes, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in last 25 years, so how many people are working on this thing all over the world? Pretty huge community, right? It's a pretty huge thing. And does all of them knew all this quantum computing? None of them knew it. If they knew it, why would they do it? If you know test of some uh, sweet, how would you, why would you test it then, right? So, so the questions are open. There are so many open questions. That's why people are working on it. And to address those questions, we need these basic things like you need knowledge of electronics, you need knowledge of optics, atomic physics, so that you can uh, make the system where you can see this special feature. Right. So, now this thing I was already telling you that uh, how you uh, can pull the atoms and so on. I am not going to spend too much time, but this is how it looks like. You need to send like a six laser beams with a very precisely tuned frequency from six directions and they all you know push all the atoms in the uh, background in a size of a ball and with this uh, you can uh, cool the atoms to few micro Kelvin temperatures. Okay, this is another uh, part. So, this is how we can cool to this nano Kelvin temperatures using um, optics uh, of the lasers for bosons and condensation. Now, uh, like once you know these atoms, how do you measure the temperature? Because at this very low temperature, you cannot put any thermometer. They will not work. Like my mercury, it will break, I think. So, uh, now what we do is that we take some pictures. We let it fall and then we take some pictures. Now, if its velocity is very, very small, then uh, it will also not expand in a very fast time, like it will expand very slow time. So, we will basically measure how fast or how slow it is expanding and from there we deduce what should be the temperature of this. This, so this is something related to called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, but if you can imagine, if you can remember that we can measure the temperature by looking at the expansion uh, or how fast or how slow it they are expanding that is I think good enough, that is the essence. So, yeah, there's few other things we have been playing with these atoms when they were trapped. So, basically this is the picture of a Bose-Einstein condensation. So, what you see in this left side, they are not yet very cold, uh, but around uh, this temperature, this is like a 500 nano Kelvin, around here this is even uh, like few tens of nano Kelvin and this is pretty like that. And when they were in this trap, so, this laser traps, they are like parabola, right. Now, if you have a parabolic surface and if you put a, let us say, small ball, it will keep on like doing like this. So, go and up and, and if you have a little friction, then at some point it will be also, it will be like a damp surface. So, we wanted to do such kind of experiments. So, what we do is that we slightly excite the system. So, this, this ball of atoms, uh, they went up and then we are seeing whether they are oscillating or not. So, this is what you are seeing here. So, it, once it is there and if you are able to image those things, uh, you have those, uh, develop those capabilities, then you will be doing all nice kind of things, uh, which will make you completely amazed. Okay, now, so how does this all thing looks like? So, this is something like a picture um, of a lab where we have been doing this thing. Now, you can think that by looking at it, so many optics. but. Uh, like this building blocks are just like this, few lenses, few meters, something called beam splitters. Now, you have to just put them into a series in a logical way. So, this planning is very, very important. You first do planning, then you go to lab and then you put your things. In between, you also need to get this uh, uh, components for that you need money. So, first I think if you know how to do the planning, then uh, you will uh, follow the steps. So, from this point, you can imagine that, okay, we are now talking about quantum computer and now if the lab looks like so large, how we are even going to get it? But this system, you can think something similar to the first classical computer around 1945. It was pretty large, people who had just wanted to do the computation. And then they went for miniaturization. I think this picture, so what you see here, so next to me, so this small uh, uh, table here, so, this is also cooling atoms, this is atom cooling apparatus and this small white dot here and this white dot, these are actually again cold atoms, they are taken from two angles, but you see how compressed, how uh, small the size is now, it is like a, in a sizable form, right, it would be maybe factor of, maybe of, I mean it was even smaller than this, I think it was 1 meter by uh, 
1 meter or 1.5 meter, something like that. And you can see its size. This is something we can trust. That this is something it can come to my, uh, come to our, uh, not at home. So another message I want to give it to you. So quantum computing, I don't know what is going to happen in after 100 years, but at least uh, at the moment the motivation is not to get them at home. But we will get them maybe some uh, industry, some company, or maybe some institute like this institute, or maybe some university where many people can access them, like a like a super com computer or like a cluster. Uh, where many people uh, can access that and they access that for a uh, specialized job. So this uh, supercomputer or cluster, have you uh, heard that people are using it for doing Facebook or for WhatsApp? No, no. So these quantum computers are also like that. So people are not going to use them for doing Facebook or sending emails. They are going to use them for very complicated calculations and finding out optimization rules and so on and so on. So uh, this is the vacuum chamber, what uh, we have uh, now set up in our lab. So all components are designed by us. For example, this part, this is the cell, this cover is still on, inside which we are going to tap atoms. And then uh, your question was, uh, sorry, uh, so uh, like where from the atoms are coming. So here, uh, there are some small uh, dispenser are mounted. So we send some current through it. Now the uh, cables are not connected. And then this creates some evaporation of some uh, atoms, cesium atoms. And through this vacuum chamber, it comes here and it creates a background vapor. So inside which we are going to trap atoms. So now this cover is on. So we have not, uh, we have another chamber we are trying to trap in there now. Uh, but this is the way to go. And at the moment, this is under vacuum. <coughs> so, so this is the card you can see. So at the room temperature, it is like 10 to the 3 uh, millibar and then we pump it down, you see how many days it takes, so luckily more than two months. We have to sometimes so heat it up also to see, to get out all other absorbed uh, molecules and atoms inside, from the inside of the chamber. So it takes lot of time, right. And now, <coughs> sorry. so these tweezers, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so these tweezers, what I was telling you, so when you trap, uh, atoms. So it's not that, uh, it's a pretty fragile process, right? So not all tweezers can be uh, uh, loaded with neutral atoms. But for a, so it can be something like this, like uh, some of the tweezers. So you can imagine that all grids are uh, uh, supposed to, uh, you know, load an atom, but they did not. Only some of them, uh, it may be roughly 50 percent because of its a probabilistic nature. But for quantum computing, we need it array where there is no defect. That means there is no, you know, empty space. So from here we need to get there, right? I had a video because of this PDF, you cannot see it there. So basically this is the picture and then we move it dynamically and then bring them like this so that we make a defect free array. Now this is set for quantum computers. So these are the uh, spots of the lasers. So these are basically 3 by 3 optical tweezers where you are going to track atoms for doing the quantum computing. And we need lasers, of course. So this is a laser, what you can see, this is the mode profile. So pretty good mode profile. So you can see it's like a Gaussian or elliptical. And few other things, so the frequency, stabilization and so on. I'm not going into too much detail. Here also I had a very nice video, but I could not show it. So uh, this is basically, you can see the wavelength here, say 852.3345502 nanometer. This would be very precisely determined and we lock this laser, I means we stabilize this frequency and it was so good that even when we were hammering on it, uh, you could see barely any change. I mean it was going slightly up and it was bringing down. So somehow like my laptop was not possible to connect and I have to make PDF and bring it here, that's why, yeah. <laughs> okay, and behind all this work like the students like you and when you will be growing a little bit more, they are working without them, I mean, you know. I cannot do anything. So quantum computing is a teamwork. So this is my team. Uh, so many students are working. Uh, they are all doing PhD or project or uh, many of them are like a B.Tech level, M.Tech level. Uh, so I am showing I think a large fraction of, of it but still a large fraction of students uh, uh, are missing in my slide. And two of my students are sitting here. So Poonam here and then uh, Arnav uh, here. 
So, they are making this lasers keep running all the time and then making these things happening. Everybody has their own job. Uh, okay. So, I think from my presentation point of view, this is all I wanted to tell you. And thank you for your listening. And then after this, I think I can invite um, maybe one row or two row and then come here and then show you how you can split the uh, you know uh, beams and how you can actually see the picture of Harry Potter here. Okay. Thank you. You can pull atoms and you can store information, I mean, in form of qubits, right? So you know what is qubit? You know what? What are bits? So what are bits? Yeah, so basically it's off, on or off, or zero or one, right? And then you have a series like, you know, you have a sequence and everything, everything like every number or uh, kind of alphabet, for example, is encoded by a particular sequence, right? So can you guess what is a qubit? Yeah, it also stores data, right, in form of quantum states, basically. So that's what was shown, right? Superposition, you know, like it can, it can have various states. Okay. So either you can make qubits out of atoms, and you need to know the state of the atom, basically. Okay. So that's how you store the information. And there are many ways. Uh, uh, which uh, was shown here, right? Like through atoms or even defects or vacancies in materials. Yeah, how the data is read from the qubits? Nano size. So basically, they are using lasers, right? To localize the atoms, right? So that's how you kind of. So maybe this is a good question which we can clarify. Right? Yes. So can this only be there? This track and then try to change the position of the lines. See, it's okay. That's a very interesting question. So he asked that. Pretty nice. How do you track the temperature, right? So now if you have an atom, you need to send some light there. So for the atom, we have to send some uh, special light. And then you just record whatever is information coming out. See, information is going from here to here. And you need to place the screen in a right place to record the information. If you put it here, it is not done. If you put it here, it is not done. So these calculations you have to do. Right? Yes. So if you have a small lens, then at home also you can do it. So this, this, this is a very really centimeter focal length. 10 centimeter focal length. Yeah. So, so this, actually, uh, they used to do this. Uh, this uh, so this is this is not focus. This is imaging. So when you imagine what? If you focus, then it will be a certain line. This is just this is just simple Harry Potter. Similar of imaging is the same. Either you have Harry Potter or if you have a Harry Potter. But you see here so nicely visible. So because of this lens is collecting the light from that, and then this is not here. So this will be the position of the camera. This is actually just screen. How can you get the data out of the quantum screen? Yeah, that's a very interesting. So you have to place the camera and send the images. And then you can see. Answer to that question. So how 
So if we uh, look at the radiation, we can also find the uh, we can also find the if we look at the wavelength of the radiation, yeah. we can also find the uh, temperature of the yes. Uh, I mean uh, yes. Uh, uh, I mean theoretically, it is possible if you look into the radiation of the black body radiation, but at this very small uh, you know temperature, so the amount of black body radiation would be very very small. So it's not uh, like you need two things. You need an observable which you can measure, and then you also have to measure it. So the pre with the present technology, it is very very difficult to measure such low uh, you know radiations. So that's why if you look into the expansion, what you have to measure is you know you have to measure the diameter of the sample roughly, and as a function of time, this diameter will change. Now in a camera, you will be uh, relatively easily able to uh, take picture of that. And then you can directly compare the diameter or the width. Uh, so that's why this technique is used. But the other one theoretically should also be possible if one can uh, get some detector uh, which can measure such low radiation. Yes. Sir, but uh, for you for calculating that diameter, we are also using the quantum. Uh, for calculating, we are not using uh, the quantum computer. So, but the atom is pretty small than five atoms. Uh, yeah, but we are, uh, you know, what we are, uh, we are going to image these are few uh, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of atoms, and then we also magnify them. So, and one, when we magnify, they come up with a distribution, same, something like a Gaussian, <coughs> and then we make a fit, uh, Gaussian fit to that, and from this fit we extract what is the width. So we get a radiation. So when the radiations are coming, so uh, why the radiations are coming? Because we excite the atoms from a lower state to a higher state. And then the radiation. This radiation is not done in just a small discrete time, but over a few nanoseconds. So when you get this radiation in few nanoseconds, then the distribution of the radiation is like a yes. Lorentzian, or if there is some mm -hmm. more imperfection uh, in homogeneous broadening, mm -hmm. then they will be Gaussian. So then you can fit those functions to those radiation profiles, and then you can expect what is the width of those. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, basically, let's get the next group. Yeah. We will not see, right? Like, if you are not able to see, then come on this side also. If you are not able to see from this side, come on my left side. And now if you put it here, then you will be able to see. Right? You can try it by yourself also. Just hold the paper and then just move it in this axis. You see that it's not coming. Yeah. And then bring it at point. You will find the surface point, right? So that's how you can uh, take picture of an atom also, but then you have to consider this size. And so yeah, so now we are uh, signing this light, but for the atoms we have to sign some special light um, so that you get some results and then uh, get that. And then we keep moving the speed to get a sharp So we get a sharp uh, picture and once you get the sharp picture, we can see it. And once we have it, then you see that it is... Uh, I mean, it's easy to see, right? I mean, if it is not here, the information is here. But you need something to measure it. So the detection is the most important thing, I think. Even if you have something interesting, if you do not have the proper detection, you will not be able to see, right? Now, this one is... Some more questions? So this one is, so like, you see the, the light is here. This is created by this thing. Input. So I was telling you this plane of polarization. Now you see if this is only one, then this is one light is going. Now with this thing, since this is called a beam splitter, you can split the light in two. Right? Now if you look at this one, you see this is just light very very easy. You can actually make it completely zero and no light. Yeah. So you can make it completely dark and completely bright, but this laser polarization is not so good. So that's why you are not able to see it 100%, but you will be able to see some variation. Right? So that is how we can change the intensity of the light. And now, um, like if you can think of this is one qubit, this is another qubit, the polarization. Then you can tune those things in a sequence and then you can do that. These are the building blocks of computer. Uh, this is something what you will miss and then this is something what you will be detecting. Now for this one, let me I can show you one more. Uh, the focus was. 
So I need another piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So it is. ऑन <laughs> You see the whole uh, structure of the elements. Sir, is there any alternate method for cooling other than laser cooling? Uh, so, uh, so uh, actually laser cooling, uh, so before laser cooling, uh, there was a cooling of ambient cooling, which I was just uh, mentioning. Uh, so that is one technique and then the laser cooling. So basically um, from the fundamental points of these are two, one is direct cooling, one is indirect cooling. So the ambient cooling is indirect cooling. So it is a very similar principle if you put your code inside the refrigerator it gets cold. So inside a dilution refrigerator is uh, pretty large something like this and maybe 1 to 2 meters long. So it creates a few mini Kelvin uh, ambience inside its uh, so volume. So inside those superconducting qubits and many other uh, like a silicon qubits uh, or super quantum dots, uh, they are kept. Uh, but for the case of laser, uh, for the case of atoms and ions, we do um, direct cooling. Uh, some cases you can also keep this laser cooling things inside, you know, to reduce this black body radiation from black home chambers and so on. But by doing ambient cooling, we will not be able to reach micro Kelvin or nanoscale. So what if we use both, like if we use both the techniques at once, ambient cooling and laser cooling? So what is the technique used here? Okay. So, so you use both of them? Both together. Both together is this. So, so uh, for, uh, so you also require the systems, for example, uh, if you have these atoms and ions, so first definitely, definitely have to cool these things uh, 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 using lasers, otherwise you will not reach micro Kelvin temperature. And now, even if you have this micro Kelvin temperature, it's a room temperature apparatus. So all the uh, bodies which are surrounding it, these metal bodies and glass bodies, they radiate uh, uh, the black body radiation. So in a very finer scale, if you want to reduce them also, then this whole apparatus you can put inside a cryo to make it even better. But the real qubit cooling is done using uh, the laser cooling. But for the case of superconducting qubit, for example, uh, so here uh, this laser cooling is not possible. So far, not possible. I don't know what is going to happen in future. Uh, so for them, they has to be placed inside a uh, dilution refrigerator. Okay. So one question from you. So maybe just to sorry to uh, maybe one more sentence. So uh, like if there is if there is any possibility to do it one wants to do the direct cooling because this is most effective way of cooling. If it is not, but for that you need a specific states and uh, specific lasers and so on. If that is not possible, then one tries for indirect cooling, that is a good thing. Yeah. So, so like you had said um, in the slide, you are showing that you are using cesium. So instead of using cesium, why don't we use elements like uh, d block elements? Because they have interstitial compounds and they also have coordination to So will that increase the superposition? So, uh, so, uh, so your question is uh, like why we don't use another atom? So ideally, uh, you need uh, few devices, and from that point of view, you can use any atom. But there are some practicalities. So practicalities of finding lasers and so on. So that's why I said this is kind of a beginning of this concept. That's why those who are research groups who are working there try to find systems where lasers are really available for it. So that is an important but. Uh, and also regarding uh, you know, lifetime and so on, the lifetime of the cells should be good enough. 
Now, can we program a quantum computer with Java or Python? So, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, the little bit elaborated answer is the following. So, when you are, uh, you know, uh, making a circuit for a quantum computer, at the end, you have to think them in terms of pulses, high pulses, like for making single qubit gates, multiple qubit, like C not gate, topoly gate, and all other things. And you have to do them in a series. So for that you have to send uh, light pulses in a series. So for that you have to change the frequency of lasers. So that you do by using Python. So that is the way of programming of a quantum computer. You can use Python, you can use C++, Java, I think it can be done, but I have not came across any uh, uh, language, uh, any example. Uh, but most of the language which are used in trapped ion, trapped atom, superconducting qubits are Python and C++. But you have just keep in mind that it is not really programming on a computer. You are actually programming another instrument. This instrument is providing pulses to the atoms. So right. programming in mean is that sense. Not the sense you do classical. You wrote a array and you got some uh, answer. You are not going to get that. You are programming a pulse sequence using Python or using C++. And this pulse sequence is going to your laser controller. This laser controller is now giving you a series of pulses in that way. And then these pulses are exciting your atoms, which are qubits, and then you are measuring this with a camera, this whole process. So Python or C is one part of it. Hello, sir. My question is that uh, why is that we can store uh, information for a very long time in classical computers, on classical computers, but we cannot do it in quantum computers? Yeah. So, so this what is, is the reason? Yeah, so this is actually a very important problem because for any kind of computation. Uh, either it's a classical or quantum, you need to store the information and uh, you, want, you not only want to store the information but you want to retrieve it on demand when you need it without uh, any distortion. So actually, uh, so my these two students, they are actually working on this now. So how to store information uh, in a medium, so you need a medium. So you can use any medium. So we are using papers that room temperature, so you also cold it medium. So now this photo, what you, some of you have shown, shown here. So photons are carrying, carrying the information, right? Now if you can store this photo in some medium and then retrieve it little bit later, that will be a memory working in the quantum domain. It's like a quantum memory, right? Now the problem is that uh, when you have light, when you have atom, they are having lots of uncontrolled, uh, you know, random uh, motions and so on. Those things are responsible, responsible for reducing their lifetime. But this is an open, uh, the first step. So how to increase lifetime of, uh, and another thing what is required. So for the case of classical computer we are keeping our data for decades. For quantum computer if I understood it correctly at this stage it is important that during computation you uh, do some small computation and then you store it for some time and then you retrieve it. Or maybe you are uh, transporting data from one place to another. Right. So for that you need some time. So the time scales for uh, present uh, defined problems are not decades, but if one can do it for one second, that is already good enough. But of course, uh, if we can do it longer, that is that will definitely find uh, more applications. So, so one just a follow-up question to this answer only. Uh, so sir, is it because of quantum superposition we cannot store information for a long time? Because uh, the particles they cannot they can exist at two different states, but they are sensitive to the environment, so they can exist uh, at a for a very small time. So this is uh, is this because uh, is this the reason why we cannot store information for a long time on a quantum computer? Because quantum computer is uh, mostly based on uh, superposition and entanglement. If I'm not wrong. So uh, I mean uh, it's what you told two things. So one is the superposition, another thing is its interaction with the environment. So superposition is good for them, uh, but uh, uh, you know interaction with environment is not good. It causes a decrease in the coherence. So that needs to be uh, minimized as much as possible. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So probably we can uh, we, we will wait for the next round, final round of questions. But we will take uh, one more group.
So probably from Faridabad, we're from Faridabad. Mm -hmm. So this is the polarization so from that way this is getting and also change the power so ideally, if the error is good, uh, then it can make it completely right. On one end, it's completely right, and then that side can change the power. So now it has some uh, So this is the last uh, group, but maybe, maybe there were some two or three very interesting questions. Maybe we can take one. Okay, so somebody asked about crypto. A question that uh, in crypto mining we have to uh, solve the hashes for this, uh, we got it also. So in crypto mining, uh, uh, or can the quantum computers also solve the hashes and we uh, will get the reward? So I mean, first of all, I'm not that much knowledgeable about crypto, but uh, like crypto blockchain, all these things. So this, they run with some algorithm, some flowchart, right? Yes. So definitely, if you can uh, involve quantum mechanics in that flowchart, then you can make them even or much more stronger. So that would make you more powerful. So it's possible, but at the moment I do not know how because I do not know the algorithms of uh, crypto. So another following question that uh, what is the speed of this quantum computers like uh, we measure in gigahertz and all? So um, I mean it depends on uh, uh, like the time uh, you need in order to make one qubit, yes. one qubit gate, two qubit gate and then how many uh, gates you have to make. So normally for the case of atoms, so these are like a microsecond or something like that. Uh, but now uh, if you have like let's say 100 such gates, it can be like 100 microsecond to do this calculation. Uh, but now you can check how much time it will take uh, to solve that particular problem on a classical computer. And you will see that if this number of qubits is going beyond let's say 10 or something, it's pretty huge. Uh, so it will take maybe few days or months or days. So that's how you can find out what is the quantum advantage you are getting in terms of computation time. Okay, so thank you. Sir, I have a question that uh, what are the main precautions we can take for the quantum computer? Uh, so there are a lot of precautions you have to take. Uh, as you have realized, these are pretty fragile things. So first of all, while uh, you know finding this laser, they have to be in check. Otherwise, instead of signing one state, you will be signing to some other state. They have to take good care of the atoms so that in showing their trap, none of the other atoms are disturbing them. You have to isolate them in a very good way. You have to make a very good platform. 
that uh, there are few such technical things, but the most important I think is the understanding. Like uh, understanding of these underlying features of how the atoms, uh, energy structures uh, are there, and which one you are measuring, which one do you need for your computation. Finding this analysis. So I think and then making a good plan. Uh, this is a good uh, or the most important precautions. Thank you, sir. Is there any reflection in the field of transferring the data to the data? So this refraction is definitely uh, uh, is, uh, it's, it's something one has to consider because uh, at this low uh, or this or this short uh, length scale, refraction will definitely cause something. And it will cause some aberration which will you know give you some slightly like, like different information. So for for that we have to you know take care of these aberrations which are happening occurring due to this. But it's a very good point we have to probably last two questions. My question is are there any chemical barriers while giving the information? Chemical barrier. Uh, chemical barrier you are asking? I like the kind of confusing this atom and then you are okay. concentrating. Uh, like if I am not, not sure whether I understood your question fully but uh, like if you think of like going towards making molecules and so on. Uh, Is it like barriers on an atom? Tunneling barrier or something like that. They definitely, they definitely play a role. I mean, those are the things uh, which makes the system uh, in interesting. So, like, are there any disturbances when the function is happening? Due to this uh, other neighboring atoms? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, one has to be. These are actually the environment. So, this environment, what we are living, that is, of course, an environment, but they are nearest uh, neighbors, uh, they are most uh, direct environments. So, the environmental disturbances? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.